Praise the Lord and welcome to Jesus or Muhammad. This is Pastor Joseph. And yes, I'm not Sam Shimon. Uh, uh, not half a Sam Shimon, but praise God I have the literally. same spirit. No, not half <laughs> literally or figuratively or in any way. No, we thank God for Sam Shimon and I thank God for David Wood who's with us here today. Brother David, another program talking about refuting Shabir Ali, which hasn't been very difficult. You know, Shabir is supposed to be tough stuff when it comes to Muslim apologists, but uh, it's not so tough if you know the Bible and you know Islam. Yeah, it's not so hard if you can mm -hmm. read, right? Yeah, I mean, and really? with any of the Muslim apologists, right? Really? And I'm, I'm not, I'm, it, they're intelligent, right? People, Shabir Ali is extremely yeah. intelligent, right? He's going for a But what he's, what he's saying, what he's saying usually depends on him saying, oh, and in the Bible there's such and such, and in the Bible there's this and that. And if you just stop and say, wait a minute, I can read, mm -hmm. let me look up what he's saying. Right. If you just read, you realize, whoa, this is total nonsense what he yes. just said to me. And yeah, yeah. the same thing we found with Zakir Naik, same, same thing we'll follow, find with pretty much any Muslim apologist we turn to. With, which begs the question once again, even Shabir Ali, who tends to the more scholarly, is he not intentionally to some degree deceiving his own people? And, 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 and no question, and just, just to clarify, um, uh, I have a lot of respect for Shabir's intellectual ability. Mm -hmm. I think his arguments yeah. are horrible, but I think his position forces him to have horrible arguments. Right. As far as Muslim debaters, if I were, if someone agreed to debate me right now, Shabir is the only guy I can think of on the planet that I would, that I would be thinking, oh, I really need to prepare, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I know he's going he's gonna to be quoting all these, uh, you know, right. textual critics and things like that. Whereas lots of people that Muslims look up to, Zakir Naik and, and others, I, <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it right yeah. now, right? I mean, yeah. I, there, there's, there's no, con no concern at all. For, uh, for their arguments. But with Shabir, I would, say, I would have to say, man, I need to go prepare because yeah. I know he's very intelligent and he's going to be quoting a lot of, uh, a lot of different sources. Right. Well, now he's going to try once again, you know, these last few shows that I've been honored to do with you, Brother David. The first one, you know, we talked about the idea of uh, the Bible and the Quran. Uh, of course, Shabir affirming that the Quran hasn't been changed, the Bible has. And then he goes on to try to prove that the crucifixion is false by, do by quoting what? Not the Quran, but the Bible. And now, again, in our third show, the, the, the first show that we did together a few weeks ago, Shabir establishes that the Bible is not trustworthy, that it's been changed. But now he's going to take the Bible and he's going to try to show us where it talks about Muhammad. And there, there's a reason for that. Muslims are forced into that because of what Surah 7.157 says. Mm. It says that Christians and Jews find Muhammad mentioned in our scriptures in the Torah and the Gospel. Right. So obviously, in the Torah and the Gospel, it says we find him mentioned, which means whatever you want to believe about corruption or whatever, we still find Muhammad He's got to be there. And yeah. the reason that's important is we now have a falsifiability test. Yeah. Muhammad says something's going to be in here, in the scriptures of the Jews and Christians, that will affirm and confirm his prophethood. Mm -hmm. And Muslims have had 14 centuries to find this. <laughs> They've had 14 centuries to say, here are the best ones. Right. And we take Shabir Ali... One of the best educated Muslim apologists in history. Obviously, if anyone can point these out, it's going to be him. Sure, right? Sure. So we can take these right now, and these are these are recent. These are uh, most of these are recent clips. So this would be Shabir after a long career in apologetics, a long career in studying. Mm -hmm. These are his best examples that we're going to be looking at tonight. His, his best, best examples. examples. Well, let's, let's not take any more time. I mean, everybody with bated breath is ready to hear this. Yeah, so. in, in, in the, yeah, in the first clip, we're, we're going to get sort of the question and okay. Shabir's overall approach. So, yeah, let's, let's check out the first clip and see where Shabir's going to be going with this. Let's look at that clip right now. Muslims of, Muslims of today, and many of them actually claim that in previous scriptures, including Bible, the coming of Prophet Muhammad, uh, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, was prophesied. Uh, how do you back that claim? Are there specific verses in the Bible that we find prophesizing the coming of Prophet Muhammad? Yes, yes. Now, we should understand this in, in the light of the way in which people have used uh, prophecy from the Bible. Uh, uh, many have said that Jesus is prophesied in the Old Testament. So we say, okay, where is his name mentioned? So, and then we find his name is not actually mentioned. Some general sorts of descriptions are given about some future figure. And then one says, oh, but Jesus fits that description. So he must be the one. Mm -hmm. So in a similar vein, we can ask, okay, does Muhammad fit that, uh, that sort of description? Now, why don't we go that further step? I mean, why do you stop only with Jesus? Okay, there we go. Brother David, why do we stop? Th 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 <laughs> think about what Shabir just said, right? Mm -hmm. Because... 
his Quran says very clearly that we find Muhammad mentioned. Yes. Shabir wants to seem to, to water this down a notch and say, well, we need to think about what Christians do with their text. What they find is various, you know, sort of vague things about someone else who's to come. And Christians say, well, that's Jesus. Yeah. Well, and why so why, why can't we do the same thing with Muhammad? Sure. Seems sensible and logical. Now, but by the way, as kind of a side note here, is that what we have in the Old Testament when it's some sort of vague mentions of someone who's to come? No. Is that what we have? No. Because, you know, we're told, are we not, that the Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem, right? Yes. So it's giving us a location. Um, of course, more than one person can come from Bethlehem, but we're specifically told he's going to be born of a virgin. Yes. Are we not? We're told that he's going to live a miraculous life. And uh, just so we can read one of these passages, again, the topic is Muhammad in the Bible, but just because Shabir said you have these vague general <laughs> mentions here. We don't know who it is, right? Let me quote a couple of verses from Isaiah 53. Let's see what kind of vague references to some random person who's going to come down the road. Yeah. Um, Surah 53, verse 3. Uh, I'll start. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Now, I would invite everyone to continue reading the passage. We're not going to spend too much time on this, right. but think about this. Someone who's pierced for our transgression. So what, what sorts of things are we told in the Old Testament? Told where he's going to be born, told he's going to be very unique, and that he's born of a virgin, that he's going to be Pierced he for is. the transgressions of the world. And then Jesus comes along and says that he's come to give his life as a ransom for many. John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Shabir <laughs> says, yeah, it's just a bunch of, you know, some, reference, some general reference about someone who's come. Really? Because that sounds awfully split. Born of a virgin? How many people does that fit? And in 714 Isaiah, there will be one born of a virgin whose name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God, God with, with us. us. Are we applying that, Shabir, to Muhammad? Do we call Muhammad God with us? And, you know, since, <laughs> <laughs> since we're, since we're quoting, uh, quoting passages, we also have, for instance, in, uh, in Zechariah, mm. where it's Yahweh speaking and says, they will look upon me, the yes. one they have pierced. So yes. Isaiah 53, they're going to pierce him. And, <laughs> and this is Yahweh says, this is this is me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also just in Isaiah chapter, uh, chapter 9 here, uh, beginning at verse 6, Isaiah 9, uh, 6. For a child will be born to us. Child's going to be born. A mm -hmm. son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, mm -hmm. Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end of, to the increase of his government or of his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So a descendant of David is going to take his throne who will be the mighty God. There's just yeah. vague references. It can apply yeah. to anyone. So why not do this with Muhammad? Yeah, because Muhammad's God in Islam, right? Yeah, yeah. all of these yeah. things. And he's going to die for sins, right? Mm, okay. I guess so. So we have, some, <laughs> we have some very clear things about <laughs> Jesus in here. But Shabir wants to say, hey, what Christians are doing with that? Well, we can do the same thing with Muhammad. Well, here we go, right? Now yeah. we're going to let Shabir give us his best. Again, yeah. this is, these, are, these, are recent, these are recent videos. Yeah. Shabir's going to give us his best examples of where they have prophecies about Muhammad mm. that are similar to the prophecies we read about Jesus. So should we go to the next let's, clip? Let's check them out. Let's go to the next clip right now. All right, now. let's see what Shabir's got for us. Uh, to give an example, uh, the, the, there, there is a passage in the Song of Solomon in chapter 5, verse 16, which says, He is altogether lovely. And uh, somebody's actually written a book about this entitled, He is Altogether Lovely, to prove that Jesus is the one. Who, he is altogether lovely. And uh, when we compare the descriptions that are uh, given in that passage, they actually fit the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as well. So if it could be Jesus, why not Muhammad? Now, the, 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 the phrase which says he's altogether lovely actually is the, a word which in Hebrew is sounded Muhammadim. 
So the word Muhammad is also heard when you read, read that word. So the, we should ask, why don't you think Muhammad? Why do you stop only with right, Jesus? Right, right. <coughs> First of all, that is a mispronunciation of the Hebrew term, which is mach, machmadin, mm -hmm. not maha, He said Muhammadin, but even that im is wrong, but he did not pronounce the, the Hebrew che. It's mach, machmadin. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Brother David. Um, Wow, this is, and we've, we, Sam and I have already responded to this from, uh, from Zucker Naik, but Shabir puts in an interesting twist on this. He says, well, well Christians have appealed to uh, Song of Solomon as talking about Jesus, so why can't we do it about Moses? I mean, why can't we do it about Muhammad? Yeah. Uh, because obviously the description here fits Muhammad, just, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Sure. Really? Sure. Now, I just want to be clear here. Christians who say that this passage is actually about Jesus I want to be clear about what, what they're actually saying. What they're saying is, because what you have in context, what this actually is, it's talking about this loving, very deeply romantic and sexual relationship between Solomon and his bride. Right, right? Right. And there are Christians down through history who are kind of shocked that the Bible talk, is talking so explicitly about this sexual right. relationship. They say, well, it must, it must mean something else. It's right? a symbolic thing. Yeah. Some people so, yeah. believe that. It's, so, it, it's a metaphor, a picture mm -hmm. of... Christ's relationship with the church. And that's a marriage relationship, symbolically. Yeah, yeah. and so uh, I, don't, I don't have much of a problem with that. I don't happen to agree with it. I think that the Bible, God, look, Muslims out there, God invented sex. <laughs> God invented sex. God's not against sex. God is for sex in the proper relationship, and that's right. exactly what you have here in Song of Solomon. I think it's affirming romantic sexual love between right. a husband and a wife. So yeah. those Christians out there who would say, this is actually all about Jesus, I'd, I'd read that and say, wow, this is some, <laughs> some wild stuff, yeah. right? Um, I don't, but again, I, you know, it, it, this could be a picture, and it can be both, right? It can be a description of, of, of both Solomon and his bride and have sort of a greater meaning. We find that often in the Old Testament. But most straightforwardly, this is Solomon and his bride yeah. talking pretty dirty to one another for, uh, for 1,000 B.C., right? Well, well and, and it is, and, and Shabir, the whole foundation of his argument, as you said, is based on the conjecture of just a few Christians of a possible symbolic mm -hmm. relationship. Yeah, and even though, but, but that, and, and he wants to say, well, well, see, because he's talking to his yeah. Muslim yeah. Uh, viewers who yeah. don't know anything about this, right? right saying right. some Christians say this is about Jesus, well, why can't we say it's about Muhammad? Right. Well, what Christians say about this is that this whole thing about the husband and the wife and their sexual relationship is kind of a picture of Christ's love for them. Who is this? What, what does that got to do with Muhammad? Is this talking right. about Muhammad and Aisha? What is this talking about? Is this talking about Muhammad and his child bride? What is this talking about? It makes no sense. And I at least understand There's what Christians are saying. There's only one wife here. in this symbolism. Yeah. There needs to be 20. If it's I under, well, well, no, he, does, he, he, he mentions a, a <laughs> bunch of ladies earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, oh, not but a, matter of fact. Not enough. Not enough. <laughs> Um, so, think about this, right? Yeah. I can at least understand what the Christians are saying. This yeah. is a picture, this is a metaphor for Jesus' love for the church. If you're saying this is about Muhammad, yeah. then there's a lot of naughty, naughty stuff going on in here. Well, it has to be, because the Hebrew word is Muhammad. Yeah, let's, let's, read, let's read this passage in context. Matter of fact, let me quote, let me, let me just, I'll, I'll just sort of randomly quote a couple of passages from this, right? Okay. So, so we're talking about verse 5. I want to give you an idea of what the rest of the book says, but it's all stuff like this, right? Let me start in chapter uh, 7 here, right? So chapter 7. Uh, this is the bridegroom. This is Solomon talking about his bride. How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O prince's daughter. The curves of your hips are like jewels, the work of the hands of an artist. Your navel is like a round goblet which never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is like a heap of wheat fenced about with, willies, uh, with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is a tower of ivory. Your eyes like pools of, in, in Hezbon. You're the, by the gate of Bath Raymond. Think about this. I know who Solomon is talking to in context. He's talking to his bride. If this, is about, if this has a greater significance than it's about Jesus, I understand who Jesus is talking to. He's talking about his bride, the church. Sure. If this is talking about Muhammad, who is he talking to? Yeah, is is he talking to Khadija? Is he talking to Aisha? <coughs> Who's he talking to? And it doesn't even make sense because it's talking about the, 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 the speaker here talks to the, the, children, the, 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 the ladies of Jerusalem. Yeah. So who's Muhammad talking to here? That, that's, that's, 
He went to Jerusalem in, here. That's in the night ride. That wasn't included in his okay, night ride. So, so in his, he had a in his night journey, he got a little <laughs> fling there. And this is a prophesy of it. We, we have a, man, Muslims could build an argument out of this one. All right. I, I'm good at this. You know. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you are good. All right. So uh, let's, let's go ahead and read the prophecy about Muhammad in context. Keep in mind, the entire context is this, uh, uh, is this man and this woman really admiring each other's physical attributes, right? And so in chapter 5, verse 10, it's the bride admiring her groom. Oh, so Chapter this is 10. actually the bride speaking. Yes, this is yeah, the bride okay, speaking. Right. She ten. says in verse 10, My beloved is dazzling and ruddy, mm -hmm. outstanding among 10,000. His head is like gold, pure gold. His locks are like clusters of dates and black as a raven. Mm -hmm. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk and reposed in their setting. His cheeks are like a bed of, uh, of balsam. Banks of sweet-scented herbs. His lips are like lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. His hands are like rods of gold set with beryl. His abdomen is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of alabaster set on pedestals of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is full of sweetness, and he is Muhammad. <laughs> well, That's how Shabir Ali wants to translate this. He wants to <coughs> insert Muhammad right there. That'd make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? And notice, let's finish it out. Yeah. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So this is talking to daughters of Jerusalem. Muhammad took his night journey there. So the only, the only place you can make sense of this, Muslim, is Muhammad had sex with some woman in Jerusalem on his night journey to Jerusalem. And the only reason at all that they take this is because a Hebrew word sounds vaguely and remotely, remotely, not like Muhammad, but remotely. And by the way, the word Mahmadin is in the plural. Yeah. So there's many Muhammads. Mm -hmm. There's many women, there's many Muhammads. Which Muhammad is he talking about? You know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. it's ridiculous. They wouldn't even bring this out yeah. if it was not for the Hebrew word, which is a complete... Brother, you're in philosophy. Explain to our regular viewers once again the importance of, of not just taking a word in Hebrew and saying, oh, this means Muhammad, because it's a completely different language. Can you explain that? Yeah, well, first of all, the, the, the word Mahmad in various forms yeah. occurs throughout the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the Old Testament. It's, 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 it's not like a, 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 an extremely common word, but right. you find it throughout the Old Testament. Right. So if Muslims want to say that <laughs> Mahmadim, which is in the plural, yeah. right, uh, if they want to say that is talking about Muhammad, well, all the more when Mahmad by itself appears, because right. that's just Muhammad, right? But they won't do that with any because it makes no sense. And yeah. the word is used in a derogatory sense mm. in, in various places. Yeah. And so they don't want to do it anywhere. Here's the only place where they can say, oh, where they can stretch the interpretation yeah. because uh, his mouth is full of sweetness and he is Muhammad. There, that's not saying anything, anything bad. It actually makes sense. And, you know, yeah. you could actually make sense. You could actually make a sentence that makes sense here. Mm. And so we'll say this is, this is Muhammad. Won't do that anywhere else where the word is yeah. used. Yeah. Uh, but right here we will because, and there's a reason mm. that they do this. Surah 61 verse 6 says that we find Muhammad's name mentioned in and, our scriptures. And by the way, it doesn't even say that. It says his name is Ahmed yeah. in the Arabic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you're going to do, start doing mm -hmm. that business, mm -hmm. it doesn't say Muhammad in the Quran. In the Arabic, it says Ismahu Ahmed. I mean, it's just a joke. Mm -hmm. The whole yeah. thing's a joke. Yeah, and uh, as Sam and I pointed out when we, were, when we were responding to this in the context of Zakir Naik, if you want to do this, you need to be consistent. Right. right? You need right. to be consistent because right. Mahmadim doesn't sound a whole lot like Muhammad. And if you want to say it's Muhammad, if you want to say, well, it's Muhammad anyway, well, then fine. Put it in all the other verses right. where that word is used. And you don't do that. None of, your, none of your leaders do that because they would be embarrassed. But if you really want to do that, why do it with just that word, right? Yeah. And we pointed out there's, there's, <laughs> there's much more similarity between the Hebrew word akbar yeah. and the Arabic word akbar. Uh -huh. They sound the same. Yeah. Right. And if we want to start saying, well, the Hebrew word says this, sounds like this, and means this, and therefore let's just, let's just cross <laughs> them over, great. The Hebrew word akbar means mouse. <laughs> It means mouse. Allah Akbar. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Allah is Allah. greater, but no, no, because we're combining Hebrew with Arabic, right? Allah is a mouse. A Allah is a mouse. So Muslims out there, if someone were to come to you and say, hey, every time you say Allahu Akbar, you're actually saying Allah is a mouse, you'd say what? You'd say, what? Why are you trying to combine Hebrew with Arabic? What are you, a crazy? Great. Now, why don't you say that when your top apologists, we're talking Zakir Naik. The best Naik, of the best. The best of the best. Shabir Ali, Zakir Naik, 
all of these guys right here. This is talking about Muhammad. And think about how desperate you have to be. You're taking a word that's used in various places. It won't make sense in any of those places except one. If you actually read the chapter, it doesn't make sense here at all. They take it in a book that is the most sexually explicit book in the Old Testament, right? And say right here in the middle of this verse about this woman who's talking about, who's talking in the context of Jerusalem yeah. and talking about how attractive her husband is, how her, his abs are so ripped. This is actually talking about Muhammad, and the only place, the only time he could be there is during his night journey. And so Muhammad's having sex during his night, night journey, and this, this is about it. That, really? And Allah's a mouse. That's, that's, that's your apology. <coughs> Surely he's got something better than that to give us. Shall we see? Um, so well, time yeah, to move on, or you want to keep going? No, let's let's go. Yeah, we we certainly we certainly uh, go into much more detail. I mean, I, James White, James White, I think did an entire show going did. through the problems with this. Yeah, he did. But yeah, let, let's try and get one more in before the break. Because you would think at least, like we said once again, being consistent, it, it says, "Who will come after me? His name is Ahmed." Mm -hmm. Well, at least bring me one that says Ahmed, not Mahmadin. Mm -hmm. Anyways, let, let's hope for a little bit better by Shabir. Let's see if he's got it. All right, let's roll that clip right now. Now, in the Old Testament, it is mentioned that Moses uh, was told by God that God will send uh, a, either a series of prophets or another prophet. It's often translated, God will send another prophet in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, a prophet like Moses. But some say that what is meant here is not just one prophet, but a series of prophets, but it's spoken about <coughs> as though it's singular. Uh, we say, okay, suppose it's a series of prophets. Well then, it goes up until Jesus, and many have said, okay, Jesus is that prophet. Uh, then we can say, why not Muhammad, on whom be peace? Because Muhammad uh, is very similar to Moses. Uh, in, in fact, uh, Musa salam, came with a law. Muhammad, peace be upon him, came with a law. Uh, they were both prophets and statesmen at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, they were governing, and so they, they have a lot of similarity. Uh, if we come to Jesus and say Jesus is like Moses and Jesus is the prophet like Moses, well, then we just need to go one step further and recognize the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him as well. I see. Now, uh, Brother David, before you destroy this argument, <laughs> I like Shabir's conversational style. He's been in the West a while, you know. And, and mm -hmm. You know, why don't we just say, why don't we just say, why don't we just say, well, well why don't we just not say? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean yeah, you, yeah, I mean, the, the argumentation he's using, right? Well, yeah. you're saying about Jesus. Why not say it about Muhammad? Yeah. Right? Uh, well, why not say it about Joseph? If you're just going to yeah. say, why not say, why not say yeah. it about you? Why yeah. not say it about Shabir yeah. Ali? Why not say it? Because we're not prophets, right? <laughs> right? We're not prophets. That's why we're not saying it. And that's why we don't say it about Muhammad. Right? So there's a, in other words, there's a reason. Ask us what the reason is. Shabir, <coughs> if you're confused, if you're confused by why we're not applying these passages to Muhammad, <coughs> ask us. Ask us. We would love to tell you. You're just saying, oh, why not? Hey, you apply it to other people. Why not apply it to Muhammad? Because Muhammad doesn't fit the descriptions here. Right. Muhammad doesn't fit any of the descriptions. In fact, answering this specific passage, and we could go into much more detail. Sam and I did go into much more detail um, in our response to Zakhar Naik. So if you'd like a fuller response, uh, be, sure, be sure to watch our response to Zakhar Naik on the, on the exact same argument. I want to get through this quickly because Shabir does bring up a, a, up a couple of arguments that, that Zakhar Naik that we didn't cover with Zakhar Naik. Okay. So we want to have time, plenty of time for those. We only have a couple of minutes before the break. So let me give you the, the short response to this. Right. Why don't you apply this to Muhammad? It says a prophet is coming after Moses. I'll give two brief responses. One, we know in context what the prophet like Moses meant to the people of his time. What did it mean to say there's a prophet like Moses? Well, there we have to go to what that phrase meant in context, like Moses. What did, what did the people of Moses' time think that that meant? Well, let's go to the last chapter of Deuteronomy. Notice I'm going to the exact same book that Shabir goes to. Right. Deuteronomy, last chapter, verse 9. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, and uh, for Moses had laid his hands on him, and the sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. Since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face for all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all his servants, and all his land, and for the mighty power and for all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. You have two requirements there for being like Moses. You know God face to face. You have that kind of relationship mm -hmm. with him, right? Mm -hmm. And number two, 
you perform miracles like no one else. Right. Jesus meets both those requirements. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, is talking about his unique relationship with the Father. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And throughout the Gospels, Jesus is performing <coughs> miracles that no yes. one else could perform. D does Muhammad meet either one of those requirements? No. No not, no, not even close, right? He didn't even get his revelations directly from God. He got his revelations through the mediation of the angel Gabriel. So it's right. nothing like Moses here, right? right? So, you, so notice what the Muslim wants to do. He wants to say, oh, uh, someone like Moses. Well, Moses was a general, right? Moses was a general and he brought a revelation. Well, Muhammad did that. So Muhammad is the one who's like Moses. George Washington and Muhammad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but think about this. The phrase is defined in the book. The book tells us what it means when it says like Moses, and yeah. Muhammad doesn't meet either one of the requirements. Let me tell you two requirements, because <coughs> this is part two. Let me tell you the two requirements Muhammad does meet mm -hmm. in the context of this passage. Shabir quotes Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he's granting that this is reliable, that we can trust this passage, right. especially when we read just two verses later. <laughs> so Deuteronomy 18.18 18 is good, yeah. then obviously Deuteronomy 18.20 is good, right? Yeah. Here... The Lord says, but the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Mm -hmm. two so we have two requirements of being like Moses. Muhammad right. doesn't meet either one of them. Right. We have two requirements of being, I mean, two criteria of being a false prophet. If someone does these, you know he's a false prophet. He has to die. And the two criteria here are, delivers a revelation that doesn't come from God, right. and speaks in the name of other gods. Uh, Muhammad did both. Muhammad did both did in, the infamous, in the infamous revelation of the satanic verses, right? Yeah. I have 37 Muslim sources on the satanic verses. And if you go back to the earliest versions of the story, mm -hmm. what you have is that Muhammad was, was feeling very sad that the Quraysh, his tribe, weren't converting to Islam. He longed for a revelation from God that would help these people convert. And eventually he got what he was looking for. The revelation said, have you not heard of Alat, Alusa, and Manat, the third, the other? These are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. Alat, Alusa, and Manat were pagan goddesses. Right. And he says these are the exalted <coughs> cranes. What he's saying is that they're, they're birds, right? And they, you can give them your prayers, and they can take your prayers to Allah. So you can pray to Alat, Alusa, and Manat, and they mm -hmm. will take your prayers to Allah. This was originally part of the Quran. Muhammad delivered these verses to his followers as part of the Quran. He bowed down in honor of this revelation. His followers bowed down in honor of the revelation. And the pagans bowed down in honor of the revelation. Muhammad comes back a little later and says, remember those verses I gave you? The devil made me do it. <laughs> Satan put those words on my mouth. He tricked me into saying them and delivering them as part of the Quran. So what do we have here? Muhammad is tricked by Satan mm -hmm. into delivering a revelation that does not come from God. Right. And he speaks in the name of Alat, Alusa, and Manat. Right. Right. So what was the requirement for a false prophet who would, have to be who would have to be killed? The prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak. So you deliver a revelation as if it's from God when it doesn't really come from God. Muhammad did that. Or which he speaks in the name of other gods, Alat, Alusa, and Manat, that prophet shall die. So and Muslims say, die. yeah, and Muslims say, Muslims say, looky here, <laughs> looky here, uh, this passage is about Muhammad. If you're granting Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, you have to grant Deuteronomy 18, verse 20. You Muslims claim that you respect Moses, that you believe he's a prophet. Shabir says, why, why, oh why, if we're saying that these passages are about Jesus, would we not also say that they're about Muhammad? Mm -hmm. Shabir, Muhammad if he had been around during the time of Moses, Moses would have told the people to pick up stones and to stone him to death right. as a false prophet. Right. We don't apply Muhammad to these verses because according to these verses that you are quoting, Muhammad is a false prophet who would have been killed. Amen. That's why we don't do it, Shabir. That's exactly right. And the book of Acts chapter 3 verse uh, 20 and following says that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his pro holy prophets since the world began. And then Acts 3.22, listen, Shabir, listen, Muslims, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. 
And whoever does not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Who is Peter talking about here? He's talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Why, Shabir? Peter makes it very clear that that specific prophecy of Deuteronomy 18 is specifically attributed to Jesus and to only Jesus. But there again, as you so eloquently put, even from Islam, Shabir is wrong. Well, we've got to take a break, folks. There's so much here. We can do shows and shows and shows. Muslims, have you woken up yet? Have you seen the deception of Shabir Ali, whether it's intentional or not? God knows his heart. Have you seen the deception of Muhammad? Have you seen the deception of Allah, Khair al Makarena? Come to Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. Let's take a break, and we'll be come right back after this with more Jesus or Muhammad. Praise the Lord. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. Hey, Pastor Joseph with David Wood. We're refuting Shabir Ali in his foolish assertion that Muhammad is in the Bible. Without further ado, let's go to our next video clip right now. What is very interesting is that in the New Testament, uh, there, there are indications that there was someone to come after Jesus. Because, for example, Jesus uh, is uh, noted to have said that John the Baptist is the greatest uh, of, of everyone who has been born of a woman. So that means, uh, since Jesus is born of a woman, everybody knows that, right. John the Baptist is greater than Jesus. Mm -hmm. And John the Baptist himself is, says in the Gospels that after me will come one greater than I, uh, whose uh, greatness is such that I'm not worthy to stoop oh. down and untie his sandals. So now, y y if you look at the equation, if John the Baptist is greater than Jesus, and the one to come is greater than John the Baptist, then that one is right. not Jesus, right? Right, right, right. 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 Because True. greater than and equal to is not the same, same thing. thing. Uh, so obviously there's one to come after John the Baptist who is greater than both John the Baptist and Jesus. According to that confession, we don't want to say, look, our prophet is greater. That's not how we go about our business. That's mm -hmm. uh, for Allah to select his prophets right. and to uh, say that he prefers one prophet over another. But uh, for us believers, we recognize all of the prophets. We love them all. We follow them all in principle. Mm -hmm. We follow the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, specifically because the revelation came specifically specifically through him. But we have indication here, uh, an indication that someone was to come after John the Baptist greater than both John the Baptist and Jesus. Thank you. You know, that argument stinks. Brother that David. is one of the most horrible <laughs> arguments ever offered by anyone for anything. And this is what really bothers me because Shabir is very intelligent. And when I see very intelligent people have to resort to arguments like this. I think, what does your religion do to you? What does your religion do to you? Why do you have to do this? Maybe he figures his people are so dull that he can put it over them. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I, know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if he really believes this stuff or not. If, I, if I so, know. if so, maybe we can give him a hand real quick. Right? Maybe we could go to mm -hmm. Toronto and see him. Yeah. yeah. No, we'll, we'll yeah. give him help right now. I'm sure oh, okay. please do. Please right. do. He's watching. I know. All right. So, um, in Matthew chapter 11. <coughs> John is in prison, and something very, I, I think, is, I think is a, the whole chapter is, uh, is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but John had already announced, and we'll look at that passage here in a moment, John had already announced at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, this is the one, this is the one, he's greater than me, he's so on, right? right? John had already announced this. But John, much like other Jews of his time, had a certain concept of the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to conquer everyone. He's going to destroy all Israel's enemies and so on. Right. This, that's what Jesus' followers, his closest companions thought he was yes. going to do. Yes. Because that had been so ingrained into the Jewish mentality. And they're right, right? The, the Messiah is going to do that. They just had their timeline off. And of they're under Roman do. oppression, yeah. so they're ripe for that kind of Messiah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And so John announces that Jesus is the one. He's the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, John gets thrown in prison. He's suffering in prison. He's yeah. ultimately beheaded. Right. He's sitting in there. Who knows how? And by the way, I'm, uh, prison conditions back then were much worse than they are today. Right? And so John's sitting in here day after day after day. What is Jesus doing? Right? What is Jesus doing? <coughs> Jesus' followers even started wondering, what are you doing? What are right. you doing? You're supposed to be doing all these things. Yeah. And so what we have in Matthew chapter 11 is John actually wonders and he sends someone. Are, are you the one? Are you the one? Because I already announced you to everyone. And I'm wondering, am, am I waiting for someone else? Why? Because I'm sitting in prison. You're not doing anything. You're not doing what the Messiah is supposed to do. Right. Let's look at um, Jesus' response. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. In other words, look at the things I'm doing, 
I'm obviously the one who was to come. Mm -hmm. But don't get upset if I'm not doing things the way you expect me to do them, right? right? Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Blessed is he who doesn't get upset that I'm not meeting your expectations because I might have other plans <laughs> in mind, right? Right, right. And after this, Jesus starts <coughs> talking about John. And let me read at, start reading at verse 11. This is the passage Shabir was thinking of. Verse 11, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Shabir says, aha, what do we have here? Jesus says there's no one born of women greater than John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is greater than everyone is born of a virgin, and, I mean born of a woman, mm -hmm. and Jesus is born of a woman. Therefore, according to this passage, John is greater than Jesus. <laughs> right? So obviously, John said, since John said in John chapter 1, that someone is coming later who's going to be greater than him. Yeah. Well, Jesus isn't greater because he's born of, born of a woman. And no, and no one born of a woman is greater than John, right? He didn't even finish the verse. Right. So since someone else is coming along, right. then obviously this person is, is greater than John and Jesus. Yeah, Muhammad. And so that's got, that's got to be Muhammad, right? Obvious. Now, now I don't obvious. know why it would be Muhammad, right? I don't know why it would be Muhammad, someone who's you know, having sex with little girls and stuff. I don't know why they would be greater than John and Jesus. But watch what happens when we actually finish reading what the verses say. And what the verse says. He stops in mm -hmm. mid-verse. Yeah, yeah. So let's finish that verse, and then we'll go over to John, and look yeah. what jo look at jo we'll go after John chapter one. This is the Apostle John talking about John the Baptist. Two different Johns. We're yeah. going to read what John the John the Apostle says about what John said. But let's mm -hmm. let's read the actual verse. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than. He. Hey, you and I are greater than John the Baptist. We are. According to Jesus. According, uh, yeah. So, so it could be us. Are, are we prophets? It could be us. Are we, it could be Call us. Call Shabir. Mm -hmm. Get him on the phone. Mm -hmm. And let's, well, we, yeah, yeah you, you, can, you can continue reading the passage. But by the way, if Shabir wants to grant this passage, notice what verse 13 says. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why? If you read Jesus' parables, God sends prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. Then the son comes. Here, Jesus even maintains that. The prophets and the law were until John. Now the kingdom of God has come. Amen. But wait a minute. No, 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 no. The prophets are still coming. According to Islam, the prophets are coming long after that uh, until Muhammad. I see. Right? And the law is, and the law is still in effect. Mm -hmm. Right? So think about this. Shabir doesn't even finish reading the verse he's quoting. And he, said, he definitely doesn't read two verses later, <laughs> which totally destroy Islam. He doesn't do any of that. Why not? Now, think about this. He wants to say that verse 11, no one, is, no, no one born of woman is greater than John, right? And therefore, that's Jesus too, because Jesus was born of woman. He doesn't even finish the verse. Why? Because the verse says pe people in the kingdom of God are greater. The least in the kingdom, least of, in the God kingdom of God. So what you have, you have two things. When it says born of woman, this is, and you can go to, go to anyone, you find this in the Old Testament, the book of Job several times, for instance. It's a Hebrew idiom about people of normal birth. Well, how is that contrasted with people in the kingdom of God? Well, those people have been born again, Amen. born of the Spirit, yes. right? Yes. So they have a supernatural birth, yes. right? They're not, even though they have been born of a woman, there was a time when they were, they were born physically. Obviously, in the, sec, in the very same verse should be quoted, if he had bothered to quote the rest of the verse, mm -hmm. you see a distinction between people who have this second birth. But obviously this would include Jesus, who also has a supernatural birth, right? Jesus right. is born of, a, born of a woman, but it's not, it's not a normal human birth, right. right? Jesus, more than anyone in history, has a supernatural birth. In fact, Jesus' origin, if you, if you go to John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. God enters creation through a woman in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. That's what John uh, 1.14 says. So... Is this, is this saying no one's greater than John? No human being is greater no, than John? not at all. I mean, first of all, Ridiculous. wasn't Muhammad born of a woman? So yes. if you want to say that, then, <laughs> okay, then, then the passage doesn't even fit. Right. If Shabir had bothered to finish the verse, it's distinguishing between normal human beings born in normal human ways and people who have some special supernatural birth. Jesus obviously has that. And then his followers who enter the kingdom of God mm -hmm. through him, we have a supernatural verse. And he specifically says, and they're greater than John. Yes. So you have the people born in the totally natural way, 
and people who have some kind of miraculous second birth or yes. who were not, uh, who did not, had, had more than a normal human nature to begin with. So this is complete ridiculous use resting of this verse. Yeah, but, yeah. but there's more. Mm. There's more. Let's go to what John actually says. What does he say? When he talks about someone who is to come after him. Yes. Ready? Yes. So John chapter 1. Mm -hmm. John chapter 1, verse 24. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. People are sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. These things John took place these things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Notice he says, there stands one among you. Yes. There's someone here. Mm -hmm. Someone of this generation. Mm. Someone who's in Israel right now. Mm -hmm. The thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. John. <coughs> Shabir just appealed to John as his argument. John says, there's someone here. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. And right. he's well, preparing the way for him. So are we to expect that means someone 600 well, years we, we, yeah, after yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we, we don't know who it is, but yeah. he's, he's somewhere there, right? Gotcha. He's somewhere there. Okay. Now let's keep reading. Okay. Verse 29. The next day he saw who? Muhammad? <laughs> no. Uh, that's not what it says, does it? The, <laughs> next, day, the next day he saw Jesus <laughs> coming and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This... Yes. Is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Think about what Shabir does, right? I'm going to quote Matthew chapter 11 about someone, about no one being greater than John, born of a woman. And I'm going to totally ignore the rest of the verse, which tells you what that means. And I'm going to pretend that Jesus is saying, John is the greatest of any human being. And then I'm going to point out where John says that someone is coming who's greater than he is. And I'm going to say that can't be Jesus because Jesus, he is born of a woman. <laughs> and so John is greater than he is. And therefore, John must be talking about someone else. What happens when you actually finish Matthew 11, 11? You read the actual rest of the verse. He explains what he means. He's distinguishing pure, physical, normal human birth with something supernatural. Right? But Muslims believe actually swallow this, John. Yeah. They don't and, read the Bible. and then uh, John says someone's coming after him, and we'll just totally ignore the part where John says, oh, and by the way, it's this, Jesus. This Jesus is, he's right here. <laughs> we'll ignore that. We'll pretend it never happened. And then we'll tell this to our, to, to our, our viewers because they are too dumb to go and look any of this up. Muslims, I just want to say, I'm not saying you're dumb. Your leaders and apologists are saying you're dumb. That's right. They are, they are say, when, they, when they spout this nonsense to you, when they rip these things out of context, when they totally destroy the meaning, they are accusing you of being so stupid you can't even open up the text That's and read right. what they're saying. That's right. Or, I think you can do better than this. I believe you can do better than this. I, can, I believe you can do better than what Shabir Ali expects of you. Absolutely. So should we go on to our, our uh, next clip? Yeah, let's like, take a look at the next clip right now. When Isa alayhi salam comes to the scene, there is already an expectation that a prophet is going to come. That prophet is going to come. So in the time of Isa alayhi salam, we also have John the Baptist, who is known to us as Yahya alayhi salam. Now Yahya is baptizing people and he's preaching with authority. So the Jewish leaders who know their scriptures, they come to Yahya and they ask him, according to the Gospel of John in chapter 1, they ask uh, Yahya, are you... The Christ. He says no. They ask him, are you Elijah? He says no. They ask him, are you that prophet? And he says no. So that means the people were expecting three figures. They were expecting Elijah who can come back at any time because they had a, an idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave Elijah the prophet to die but lifted him up. And they thought that any time Elijah will come back into the earth. So they're asking, are you this Elijah? They are expecting that uh, the Messiah, the Christ, will come. Messiah means Christ. Al-Masih means, in Greek, the Christ. So they're asking him, are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? He says, no. They ask him, are you that prophet? He says, no. Now why do you ask a thing like that? 
Are you that prophet? It means there is a specific prophet that they're expecting, and they're asking him, are you that prophet? And he says, no. Now, Isa, alayhi salam, obviously was the Christ, and he came just uh, shortly after uh, Yahya, alayhi salam. He was born six months later, according to the New Testament. So, if he is the Christ, well then, who is that prophet? Obviously, one who was still to come. Okay, David, go for it. Well, there, there, there are about a, a, a million problems yeah. with, uh, with this argument. And we don't have time for them. Yeah, please. first, <laughs> first, l just think, he's quoting John chapter 1, and the mm -hmm. passage he's referring to is John chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, very yes. common Muslim passage to appeal to. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the general argument is the Jewish leaders mm -hmm. came to John the Baptist, because right. mm -hmm. John the Baptist is obviously someone special. Right. And they say, are you the Christ? Mm -hmm. No, I'm not the Christ. Yeah. Are you Elijah? Mm -hmm. No. Are you the prophet? Mm -hmm. No. Who are you then? Yeah. I'm the one who sent ahead of the Messiah, right? Right. Um, so the entire argument is, well, since the Jewish leaders asked if you were this one, this one, or that one, the Jews were obviously expecting three different, three different individuals. Yeah. And Shabir Ali points out, these were the people who really knew the scriptures. Sure. So these the are the Christ people who knew the scriptures. and that prophet must be different mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. according mm -hmm. to Shabir. Yeah. Now think about, think about the various problems we have here. One, where is Shabir getting this quotation from? The Bible. Where at? John 1. 1. John 1. Is that a good place for Muslims to be going to say this is what, <laughs> this is what, this is what John Muslims saw? Muslims say is... that Jesus is not God. So. Yeah. Let me, just, let me just give you a couple things from verse 1. I invite Muslims to read the entire thing. See, notice, notice the difference between me and Shabir. Yeah. He doesn't want you reading this stuff because yeah. then, you realize, then you'd realize how silly this yes. is, I want you to read these verses because I want you to have a greater understanding. Even if you ultimately reject it, at least know what the, what the passage is saying. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him and apart from Him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. You know who the Word is. The Word is Jesus. The Word is Jesus. This passage, John 1, same chapter Shabir is quoting, says that Jesus is God and that all things were created through Him. How do we know? Well, we get down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And this is where we have that passage that we referred to uh, uh, earlier. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. So this is where John existed says, Existed yes. before. Yeah. But he's six months younger. So John to... says Jesus existed before him, <coughs> even though Jesus was younger than him. Why? Because Jesus is divine. Mm. Right? Verse 17 and 18. I'm going to read 17 and 18. Notice why? Because this is right before 19. These are the two verses before 19. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, meaning God in all his glory. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Does that line up with Islam? Is that good Islamic teaching? Mm. And the answer is no, it's not. Now we have 19 through 21. And if you want to know what's in the rest of the passage, uh, verse 27, that's a passage we quoted earlier where John says, it is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, talking about Jesus. Uh, verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Is Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Sounds like it. He is, he is in this yeah. passage, he is in the same chapter that Shabir is quoting. Yes. This is he on behalf of whom I sit. After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me, mm -hmm. affirming again the deity of Christ. Yes. Um, and in verse 34, John says, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Yes. Is Jesus the Son of God, according to Islam? <laughs> it is according to this chapter that should yeah. be quoted. Yeah. And let me go to uh, the end of the chapter after Jesus, uh, uh, he, he gets several followers and so on. Uh, verse 49, Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God, according to Islam. Mm -hmm. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Angels are ascending and descending on Jesus. Jesus is the ladder to heaven. But he chooses this chapter in which to bring what he believes is inspired scripture. Over, so what do you have? You have the deity of Christ, right? Jesus created everything in this chapter. Jesus is the son of God in this chapter. Um, 
the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yeah. He's the ladder between yeah. earth and heaven. Yeah. All of these things, totally contrary to Islam, yeah. and Shabir Ali goes right in the middle of the chapter, takes, takes a couple of verses out of context. He says, yeah. you see, they're distinguishing between these three individuals, so it must be Muhammad. The point is, they didn't know. They didn't even know there was a fourth <coughs> option. John the Baptist gives them a fourth option. They didn't even know it existed. Mm -hmm. But he's telling us that they're the ones of the authority. They don't yeah. know. And, here, and here, here's what's absolutely essential. Did the Jews have correct expectations about the Messiah? It was muddled. It was, it was confused. They had some things right, but they were expecting mm -hmm. other things, and they got it wrong. If, if Shabir wants to say the Jews knew their scriptures, and they, therefore they would have been right, yeah. um, then he has to conclude that Jesus was a false Messiah because Jesus didn't come and conquer the Romans like they expected, right? And they have to believe that Jesus mm -hmm. claimed to be God definitively because yep. that's what they accused him of mm -hmm. and put him on the cross mm -hmm. for. And let, let's go on, and then we, uh, we'll get to our last clip, and then we'll wrap it up. That will only, that will only take a minute because it's so easy. Um, if you want to build, watch the inconsistency. If you want to build your argument on Jewish expectation, <laughs> Jews were expecting, let's say, let's say, let's grant it, and all we know is a, couple, a particular group of Jews, right? Right, right? Jews were expecting three different individuals. Shabir said, aha, they know the scriptures, and they know that, that it was three <coughs> separate people. Okay. Who did they come to? Did they come to an Arab? Because they expected an Arab prophet? No. no, they came to a Jew. What do you mean? People yeah. who understood Deuteronomy understood that it's from your brethren, that means your fellow Jews, and they came to a Jew to see if he was the but prophet. this took place in Mecca. No, it didn't. <laughs> he came to a Israel. Jew. They came to a Jew yeah. because they expected the prophet to be a Jew. So what right. can Shabir here say here? Well, when they expected the Messiah to come and conquer, they were wrong. But when they expected the prophet to be different from the Messiah, they were right. And when they expected the prophet to be Jewish, they were wrong. Yeah. So it's just pick and choose which expectation right. was correct. Did right. any of these people expect an Arab prophet to come in Mecca six centuries later? <laughs> no. So if you're basing your argument on Jewish expectation, Muhammad isn't the one. And if you don't want to base it on Jewish expectation, where did your argument go? Look at what chapter you're quoting. This is horrible. Let's look at our last clip. I'm going to take a second. Let's look at that clip right now. Now, Isa alayhi salam also spoke of that prophet. Because in the Gospel according to John, in chapter 16, in verse number 7, and other related verses in that area, he's talking about a similar individual who is going to come, who is going to hear the words of God, who is going to prophesy and tell about the things which will happen. He's obviously referring to the same individual that was spoken about in the Jewish scriptures, that prophet like Moses. All right, now... Uh, it's very common for Muslims to appeal to John 14 through 16 and say that yeah. the comforter is Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And by the way, blasphemy doesn't get any more severe than this from a Christian perspective. You right. start messing around with the Holy Spirit. You look right. in these passages, it's clearly referring to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And when you start saying, oh, that's Muhammad, well, then you're telling me Muhammad is <coughs> the Holy Spirit and you are committing some horrible blasphemy right there. But uh, you can look at our entire response to Zucker Naik, uh, who uses uh, a similar passage. Notice, Shabir only gave one verse. Yeah. He gave one verse. Yeah. Let's look at what this verse actually says. Jesus speaking, he, Shabir gave one verse. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Mm -hmm. But if I go, I will send him to you. Yeah. If I go, this is Jesus talking, says, if I don't go away, the helper is not coming. But if I go, I will send him to you. Right. Now, uh, Did Jesus Pastor send Joseph, <laughs> who sent Muhammad according to Islam? Uh, well, uh, Allah called him. Allah yeah. sent Muhammad yeah. as a prophet. Yeah. But according to this passage, Jesus. Muslims want to say that the helper is Muhammad. Yeah. Wait a minute. The helper is sent by <coughs> Jesus. Jesus sends the helper. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Pastor Joseph, if the helper is sent by Jesus, yeah. and Muhammad is sent by Allah, mm -hmm. and Muhammad is the helper, mm -hmm. who does that make Jesus? <laughs> Jesus would be God. <laughs> Jesus would be Allah. So Shabir Ali just quoted a verse which if you read it and you believe it, you have to believe as a Muslim, that Jesus is the God who sent Muhammad because Jesus sends the helper. The helper is Muhammad. Muhammad is sent by God. That makes Jesus God. Your only alternative is to say, I'm not going to quote that verse. But that's the only verse that Shabir gave us from this general area. And so if you want to believe Jesus is God, believe Shabir.
That's all I got. <laughs> well, thank you, Brother David. And thank you, viewers, for watching. I mean, hey, here again, Muhammad is not in the Bible. Uh, Muslims have been trying desperately. You know, Muslims, we have to, I mean, Muslims are in a tough spot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. They have to find it. They yeah. have to find I it. I mean, as Christians, we don't have to find anything in the Quran except falsehood, which is what it all is. Mm -hmm. But for Muslims, they're in a tough spot. Tough and, spot. and so they keep trying to find Muhammad in the Bible. At the same time, they, try, they keep trying to tell us the Bible is wrong. If they ever find anything that they think that they might be able to somehow rest and twist and make it sound like it's Muhammad, all of a sudden that part of the Bible is supernaturally inspired. Everything else is wrong. Even, I mean, if, even if we have to cut off mid-verse. Mid-verse. Mid I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Shame on you, Shabir Ali. Shame on you Muslims for allowing yourself to be duped, like Brother David said. I believe that you're in the image of God, and like Islam says, I believe you've got a mind. Open the Bible, read it, use it, believe that Jesus Christ is in fact God, is in fact Lord. Hey, thanks for watching Jesus or Muhammad. God bless you, and be back with you right here next week. David Wood and Sam Shimon.